all of these international things. Uh, the Indian diaspora is becoming more and more influential in the countries where they are strong around the world, including the United States, Canada, Britain, and others. Um, so, you know, it, it's, to me it's self-evident. Um, I'm surprised uh, but how many people to whom it's not self-evident that India has become and will become more of a major player in the world. Um, I think television is playing a huge role in contemporary India for many reasons. Uh, one of them is that India, from the very beginning of its independent existence uh, in 1947 and into the 50s and beyond, had a powerful media, had a powerful press. Now that, in those days, was probably consumed by a very small elite and influenced them almost exclusively, largely due to factors of literacy, uh, perhaps infrastructure, distribution of newspapers, and so on. There was, however, radio uh, in those days that was widely listened to and hugely important government run, but nonetheless very important in the development of the country. Indians are consumers of media and have been for all of their independent existence. That uh, is, is a fact that Indian television uh, today is able to take advantage of. Um, India only got private television, if you like, or television that wasn't run by, owned by its government. Uh, in recent years, by through the back door. Um, in the 1990s, late 80s, 90s, the technology of satellite television around the world uh, began to uh, proceed exponentially down a consumer-driven path. It, previously, television networks used satellite technology, beamed their signals from the earth to the sky um, for distribution around a country or around a region, and sometimes around the world. Um, not that all that often and not as a general practice because it was hugely expensive, very technologically challenging. There were very few earth stations where you could take your material for uplink uh, and there were other, very few of the other type of downlink stations. And again, it was an expensive, complex, not always reliable process. But that all changed in the 80s. Uh, people began, global television began, CNN in the first Gulf War pioneered many of the techniques of almost uh, consumer-driven, as I was saying, um, satellite television. We got to see live reports from Baghdad uh, through CNN correspondents, some of them. Admittedly, they admitted it themselves, hiding under their beds as the Americans bombed Baghdad. But we learned about that in live, real time. Uh, that pioneered not just television news, but also the technology of television delivery in general. As that was happening, satellite television was broadening its, its reach in Asia. Rupert Murdoch um, entered into satellite television from his base in Australian and British newspapers and established Star TV in uh, Hong Kong, a Hong Kong-based super network, if you will, um, a cluster of channels that were um, entertainment and news and other types of channels, repackaging programs, not originating much. But it was in the news area that Star TV was a very much, very much a pioneering force in Asia and particularly in India. For in the early 90s, when all this was happening, India's broadcasting restrictions were very, very tight. They required that uh, the government basically um, own and um, manipulate and dictate the content of any news broadcast that originated in the country. So in other words, you just had Indian television channels and Indian state television channels and Indian radio, uh, all India radio owned by the government. And then the BBC and propaganda channels from neighboring countries, from Pakistan, from China, uh, the Voice of America, of course, uh, all, the, all these different channels. But they were all, they were run by governments aimed as, as a political exercise at uh, pushing another country's point of view in the Indian subcontinent. Murdoch's idea was to take advantage of the fact that there was no regulation in the Indian broadcast regulations that foresaw people downlinking satellite television on their own and distributing it through local cable networks, which were just coming up. And literally in those days, you saw neighborhoods in uh, slum colonies in Delhi and Mumbai making satellite downlink dishes out of uh, garbage can lids coated with tin foil and sort of bent a little bit so that they were more of a parabola, and then hooking several huts and then more and more huts up to um, satellite television from the skies. And from the skies in those days, on these satellites, you could get you know, a plethora of the world's channels. Uh, they just weren't downlinked in India. Murdoch started to do that with Star TV. Um, India's cable operators were taken into the mix and 
satellite television spread like wildfire through this, uh, through this mechanism. So what you had was um, a Rupert Murdoch-owned Star News channel, but it had uh, in Delhi uh, a news gathering staff of camera crews and reporters and anchors, um, very famous people who are still uh, influential today in Indian television, people like Pranoy Roy and uh, reporters like Barkha Dutt and Rajdeep Sardasai. These are the, some of the famous names of early Indian television that are still uh, influential today. Um, others followed in different parts of the country. They broadcasted at first in English, which again was aimed at a fairly elite audience in the, in the capital cities uh, of the, the major cities of the country, the capital, Delhi, state capitals. But uh, in the south, in Tamil Nadu, um, entrepreneurs managed to set up cable stations and use that money to set up their own um, local uh, Tamil language services, and then that spread into other Tamilian language areas like uh, neighboring states, Karnataka, Kerala, um, and Hydra and, uh, and uh, Andhra Pradesh. Uh, channels began in Mumbai in the various languages that are spoken there, and soon you had, over the course of a decade, all sorts of satellite television all over India broadcasting news into the homes of Indians. What was interesting was this was all in defiance, um, in many ways, of the regulations of the day, which still required that if you were an Indian television station that broadcast, uh, you, you would put up a stick uh, that would broadcast terrestrial television signals to an area uh, where your advertisers lived and you would buy advertising and put out a television channel in the, in the sort of North American way. What these people were doing was similar to that, but they were actually broadcasting by beaming their signal up to the skies, perhaps through Singapore, and then downlinking it in India. And in, in such a way, not just going you know, a couple of hundred thousand kilometers up and down, but around the Indian broadcast regulations. India was going through a lot of political turmoil in the 90s, and no one government, no one political party dominated government um, from about 1996 onward. And the broadcasters took advantage of that, uh, the fact that coalition governments were the, were the norm at the federal level in India, the central level that, broad, that regulated broadcasting, to keep the broadcasters from being regulated, to keep themselves from being regulated. Television spread uh, unexpectedly, exponentially, through the back door, television news. And uh, I, you know, I, I, for one, always believed in that phenomenon. Uh, I thought it was a wonderful thing. It was a way to, to really broaden, uh, if you like, press freedom in India. A lot of people deplored the fact that this was happening you know, outside of the regulatory framework, outside even of the democratic framework. The political parties were not really weighing in on this, although they were certainly happy for the opportunity to get their mugs on air and to, to, to use the television programs, the news programs, to distribute their messages. But what they weren't doing was establishing the regulatory framework for this. It was all happening at light speed, but uh, no one was in control of it except for the commercial masters of these new services. It wasn't a conspiracy. It wasn't, uh, even though Rupert Murdoch was involved, uh, it wasn't a, a hugely um, commercial activity at first. Murdoch spent 10 years losing vast sums of money in establishing Star TV uh, and Star Television uh, News in India. Um, his competitors, they were the big India media houses in Delhi and around the country, and also some of the well-known corporate names of the country. They invested and lost a lot of money over the years in doing this, for that's the nature of television, a huge upfront cost that takes many years uh, to recoup, so you have to be prepared for that. It was also all happening hugely transparently, uh, in that the uh, Indian print media was covering it uh, very attentively, taking people to task, uh, looking out for sharp practice, and also you know, raising important nationalist questions, like do we really want to turn our public airwaves, such as they are, even though they come from space, and no one really regulates that in the, in the liberal democratic sphere, uh, do we really want to turn that over to, to foreigners, to uh, companies run by Murdoch, or um, to people of uh, other nationalities, NRIs, non-resident Indians, based abroad, which was the case with ZTV, for example, one of the big Indian uh, channels today as well as then, one of the early pioneers. Um, and the answer from the public was, as long as we get the choices that we are getting right now, we're quite happy to leave the system as it is. You tinker at the, uh, at the uh, fringes with this. So throughout the 90s and into 2000, you had an explosion of channels 
um, a ridiculous number of channels, uh, actually. Um, you know,